My name is Anna Brooks and I'm a senior lecturer and immunologist at the University of Auckland and I'm sort of coming up about 20 years sort of experience in human immunology and yeah when the pandemic hit I sort of was watching very very closely uh, what was unfolding and my sort of core area of research or my technology or core skills is flow cytometry which is essential, essentially a fancy instrument uh, that we use to sort of dissect all the different immune cells in the blood and that was sort of one of the things that I thought we're going to need to know what this virus is doing. That was the starting point and the rest is a blur essentially so yeah from there I was watching everything unfold internationally and then watching it hit our shores and yeah and as I say I, I sort of watched in real time uh, people not recovering from their infections and yeah the rest is history really haven't stopped. So I was really interested in what was sort of happening in the long COVID space because as we, it was a new virus that was hitting our short, well, the, the globe. Uh, we didn't know what this was doing to our immune system. And as we were learning, some people were not recovering. So this was interesting, alarming, and all the rest of it. And before long, we then started seeing, you know, the people coming forward, obviously saying, hey, post-viral illnesses are not unexpected this isn't new and that's where you know a real international voice came together saying hey we know what this is this is this is myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome type scenario or we need to talk we need to come together and I guess at that point it, it's a real blur for me how and and why I sort of wanted to sink my teeth into that um, but it it was just everything coming together and thinking gosh we really don't know enough about the impacts of infections on us and you know what's causing that sort of lasting impact to our immune system but we needed to know more absolutely. There's been a lot of research into long COVID now but essentially it didn't really start until probably the beginning of 2021 I think you know the alarm was raised May 2020 long COVID was coined by patient advocates and you know it took a long time for anyone to, to wake up to to doing the research and that's so essentially we were seeing the necessity to do this and we had to therefore raise that uh, global voice to sink resourcing into the research space and historically MECFS was in the same space of being neglected in research and in medicine so it was kind of like a, a force that had to be, uh, you know, that had to sort of evolve from there, I guess, yeah. So initially very little was done. And now there's, I think at last count, there's been over 10,000 scientific publications on the, at least not so much just long COVID, but the impacts of infection. So there's so much known now. So what we do know about long COVID or what's sort of coming through the literature, you know, nothing sort of cemented or locked down yet. You know, we, the, the, the space is already going to continually evolve, especially with new variants and vaccinations as well. But if we sort of step back and sort of think, what, what are the sort of, um, what aspects do we know? We know it's disrupting the immune system. We know that there's definite inflammation involved. We know that there's probably, you know, if there's not sort of physical, you know, sort of detectable rather, organ damage, we know that our vascular system, our blood vessels that feed our whole body uh, are likely to be damaged. And so there's hints and tips all through the literature pointing to those things. Uh, and really, and, and one of those things is that we know that um, SARS-CoV-2 is not just a respiratory virus. So it's causing that systemic inflammation. And what we don't know, I mean, there's tons we don't know, but we know that it's likely to be, those are the sorts of triggers that we have disrupted uh, clotting system, disrupted immune system, and therefore just sort of a, a state of vulnerability, if you like, for, for our bodies in it in, as we recover. And for many of us, we might not even feel or know that there's this underlying damage and that we have to rest through that on our trajectory to recovery. And for others, you know, that doesn't happen, right? And we don't understand exactly who that happens in and why, uh, but essentially those are the sort of bits and pieces coming together. The sort of key centerpiece of all of this is obviously viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 is the trigger, is the insult, but then there's another layer here. We believe that, you know, so 
one train of thought is that the ongoing trigger to the immune system and the alarm signals that are going off is that we haven't fully cleared the virus. Another train of thought is that because of our immune system getting disrupted, our normal immune control, where we wander around every day keeping any latent viruses or dormant viruses that we've had, you know, that we contracted in our childhood, that they're getting reawakened. And this is sort of an area of research that's really heating up, if you like, because when we sort of take for granted that we wander around beautifully keeping everything in control, many of us may not even know that we're doing this. Uh, you know, our bodies are full of microbes, right? You know, we're, we're an apartment block of other species, right? We've got so many little microbes in us and, and under control or suppressed viruses is one of them. And, uh, you know, these childhood viruses that we get, you know, we brush off as sort of benign or, you know, that we never think about them again. And a, a key one is Epstein-Barr virus. And it's now, you know, it's, it's linked to some cancers. It's now getting linked to multiple sclerosis. We know it has links to MECFS as well. And, you know, it could be one of the core viruses that lays dormant in us that's causing some of this sort of uh, bubbling away, if you like, or smoldering baseline sort of reactivation that we don't have the tools to detect. That's the key thing. We don't have good tools or any tools really, clinically or diagnostically, uh, or in the research arena to detect what that looks like. And so that's kind of where the research is heading is that we need to see, can we detect this? Because historically these things have been looked into, but I think, you know, we often sort of dismiss them because we're like, oh yeah, we've always known that EBV might cause ME and people have looked for reactivation, but I would argue we don't have the correct tools yet. And bearing in mind also that, you know, the, the prevalence of getting EBV is like at least 90% of us. You know, it hangs in our oral cavity. It's called the kissing disease because we get it as, as teens and only some of us get glandular fever. So what that also teaches us is that, you know, most of us get it asymptomatically because we now hear all about that with, with COVID-19 too, that you can get that asymptomatically. But glandular fever is the symptomatic illness in a teenager. And so again, most of us get it, a subset of us get it badly. And then, a sub, and then some of those people have definitely been coming forward saying, I now have long COVID. So, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just a vague linkage because there's certainly people who have glandular fever who don't have long COVID, but you know, it's just an interesting link. And EBV or Epstein-Barr virus is just one of the herpes family that we have for life and it can reawaken throughout our lives. And so, you know, there's another one, cytomegalovirus. I had never heard of CMV until I worked in an immunology lab. It was like, what is this virus? Again, boring, dismissed virus. You know, that, that's not so linked to, to long COVID, but it's another one that we live with. And the other one that we're more, I guess, people see is, you know, when we get chicken pox, we then get a shingles outbreak later in life. And certainly people have been seeing shingles outbreaks with um, after they get COVID. So that's a classic uh, visual, if you like, of a reactivation of a virus that lives in us dormantly, you know, for our lives. So it's a strong hypothesis, or at least part of the picture, because long COVID is likely to be this sort of umbrella term and there will be different categories or of um, trajectory of recovery, I, I believe. You know, like I don't think it's necessarily going to be this thing is caused by this and this person and therefore it's the same in everyone. So that's, those are sort of the strong leads I think that we have right now is, is it pulling together at the center of that is the immune system because the immune system has been disrupted. It normally keeps our you know, viruses under control. It, it's, it does its job, you know, immunothrombosis is the term that we use when we get infected uh, with either the viruses or bacteria to, to clot, you know, to, to get rid of and shut down an immune, during an immune response. So that's all normal procedures. We just don't know why some of us potentially don't resolve that. Hence why we emphasize the, you know, the, the resting phase. Because until we have a tool that we can track and say, okay, it looks like you're, you're going good now and you're back to baseline and you're feeling good, you know, we, it's going to be difficult to sort of know what the actual trigger point is for someone who's recovering and who's someone who's not. Long COVID can impact all age groups. We know that there's likely to be a skewing that, you know, little children are less likely to get long COVID, but certainly it's happening. And we know teenagers 
are getting impacted and obviously adults as well. So we're never really going to get a good handle on prevalence, but previously healthy is, you know, healthy, your health status does not make you immune to getting long COVID. And I think that's one of the things that really has alarmed people, you know, that people come forward and say, I was a marathon runner, I was a super sports person, I got COVID, I barely even noticed, and now I had a really debilitating long COVID. And I think that's really alarmed some people. So it's sort of really telling us again, this is not a cold, this is not a flu, this is a virus that's really causing damage in ways that we can't see, see and often feel. You know, if you've, if you've got a mild infection and barely even get a cold or flu-like symptom, you know, the classic scenario, fevers and uh, coughs and sore throats and sneezing, you'd never potentially think that you could go on to have this, you know, debilitating fatigue and brain fog when you barely even noticed that you had a virus. I think so. So the short answer is that anyone is at risk of this and I think you know as the research has been coming out sometimes there are risk factors or groups often sort of said you know it might be more common in women, it might be more common in older age but really what the research is showing us is anyone is at risk because we can't point to someone who's perfectly healthy who suddenly you know gets debilitating long COVID so anyone is at risk. In New Zealand, our trajectory here, you know, we had uh, a, a small group of people with long COVID during 2020. And then the next phase for us was the vaccine rollout. Internationally, they'd already had, you know, multiple waves, lots of people with long COVID. And in fact, you know, most places were rolling out their vaccines uh, uh, before us too. So what I really noticed here, and in fact, the international groups came to me to ask these questions. Absolutely, because uh, some people have been impacted by vaccination. And by that I mean, you know, like, a vaccination is training your immune system, right? So the virus has 29 proteins or something like that. And uh, a vaccine is training us to recognize the one protein, the spike protein, so that we can train the immune system to say, hey, when you see this, shut that thing down. And so we're training up our immune system to do its job so that if, if and when you get exposed, you shut that down really quickly. So to do all of that, we need building blocks. We need a tip top shape immune system. You know, that, that includes, you know, being nutritionally fit and all the rest of it. What that picture is and what that prescription is to, to have a perfect immune system, we don't know, but essentially it can go wrong. It misfires. You know, we have a whole list of illnesses related to our immune system failing us. We have autoimmunity, we have cancers, you know, this is where our immune system fails us. So it's the same sorts of things can happen in the context of vaccination. I believe like one scenario or one rationale behind why what could be going on here, and I saw it as an interesting scientific question, is that if we're seeing people who have just been vaccinated having similar symptoms, that tells us that it's the anti-spike immune response that's triggering something a little bit unusual. And sometimes, like it's in the international groups, again, would often engage with me to sort of say, are you seeing exactly the same thing? Is it different? And it's hard to actually really tease that apart, but there's total overlaps, absolutely total overlaps. And the other aspect is that every vaccination causes that, every type of COVID vaccine can cause these symptoms. It's not an mRNA vaccine bad reaction. It's not an AstraZeneca bad reaction. And those things, you know, I saw, as a scientist, I saw that as reassuring, but it's not reassuring at all, right? Because we can't, there's not an alternative. But what the reassuring aspect of that was, was that it's not a, a bad vaccine. It's that our bodies are unfortunately failing some of us and we're having an immune response that goes haywire or it didn't go as planned type of scenario. That's how I pragmatically break down what's going on. Because I certainly saw these impacts happening internationally before we had vaccinations here. Um, and I was just like, you know, we need to be aware of this. Uh, you know, we need to sort of understand scientifically what's happening. But that's how I see it, is that it's an anti-spike immune response. And, you know, you know, I won't dive deep into the aspects of what that really means, but there's so many reasons why, like autoimmunity, right, is where our immune system's doing its job, fighting off 
an infection and then whoops a daisy it starts attacking our own cells and we trigger off a, an autoimmune response and you know and that's one of the hypotheses actually that can be why you know in, in long COVID and you know a vaccine response could be an autoimmune trigger so the short of it is we don't understand exactly what's going on but it certainly seems to be related to a misfired anti-spike immune response at least you know, and again, it's probably not every single person who's been impacted by in, in a negative way by the vaccine is this exact same pathway, but it's likely to be a, a part of a misfiring immune response, yeah. So there's so much more we need to understand about our immune systems and, you know, how to supercharge it to, you know, to be primed and ready to be, to do its perfect job, but, you know, the immune system's baffling. One thing this pandemic has taught us is, you know, we've heard all this terminology about asymptomatic infection and, and obviously mild, you know, you know, you might know that you've had a mild infection, but I think it's really brought home that, you know, you can get a virus or you can get infected and not feel it at all, but you've, you're infectious, you could be spreading it to other people. And the other thing it's taught us is that, you know, some people, well, different phases of the pandemic have been, have helped reveal certain aspects. So when there was widespread testing, we could, we got a good handle on asymptomatic infection. It was like, okay, you know, there's X percent can get this asymptomatically. And therefore, because we were tracking it and understanding asymptomatic infection, we could see that people would end up getting long COVID. It's because they knew they'd tested prior. And that's absolutely a possibility. And on top of that, you know, different phases of the pandemic, uh, testing accessibility at the beginning was a problem. So many people here in 2020 uh, with long COVID symptoms didn't have access to a test. So whether that was because, you know, the, I mean, the whole world had to suddenly jump and produce a perfect test and that wasn't the case. You know, we didn't have enough testing. So there was lots of people back then that um, didn't have access to a PCR test and then obviously as we've come through now we've got the accessibility of the rapid antigen testing or the RATS and so but again none of these tools are absolutely perfect and that you know the user is part of the picture as well how well you swab your nose even the person swabbing your nose or or you know which phase of, of your infection you're at and all the rest of it so the short answer is that you know we do know that some people will not test positive even though they have tried to and all the rest of it or with asymptomatic infection they may have never tested so you know like as in the two scenarios are you've got an asymptomatic infection and then end up with uh, what feels like long COVID or you've got long COVID symptoms versus uh, you know testing having symptomatic illness and you actually just didn't test positive on any of these t tests and we certainly know of someone in that in that uh, category who's been very sick with long COVID-like symptoms, definitely had an acute phase, was very sick, had all the tests done, you know, this is curious, we don't know what's wrong, and then recently had a, um, an antibody test to then show that they'd had a historical infection. So what that means is, you know, we, we've had sort of antibody tests available. So the antibody testing essentially just gives us a snapshot in time of uh, your uh, immune response to whether it's the virus or the vaccine. So it, there, over the course uh, of the pandemic here, it's not been widely uh, utilised in New Zealand, I would say, and uh, certainly the access wasn't easy. So uh, just just this year, you know, there, there is now a, 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 um, a, a consumer accessible test. Again, it's not perfect, but essentially what we're doing in this test is we're measuring uh, your antibodies to the spike protein. So that can be vaccine or virus, we can't tell the difference. But there's also an antibody against uh, the nuclear capsid protein of the virus, which is on the inside. So if you have detectable antibodies to the nuclear capsid protein of the virus, you had COVID. So where it's not perfect is that if you find them, if you have a test done and you test positive, you had COVID. If you don't test positive, it doesn't rule out COVID. It's just, it's, it's a gray test, you know, like it's one tool in the toolbox to say, you know, I never tested positive because I either had asymptomatic or, or you know, my test never returned a positive. Is there any chance I had this? And you can check. And if it comes back negative, you know, it's not a tool to sort of say, no, nope, it's not COVID. It's more a tool to sort of try and 
get to the bottom of it. This is also important um, in children as well. Again, you know, we're in uh, the thick of COVID and widespread infection rates. We, again, I was speaking about Epstein-Barr virus, a classic childhood teenage illness. We need to remember that, you know, those viruses are still out there. We're still spreading them like wildfire. So, you know, it, it's, it's that, it's bringing that awareness of post-viral illnesses absolutely, uh, you know, it, it's out there and to not necessarily think everything is caused by a particular virus. You know, I guess I'm saying, you know, check for all viral infections, uh, you know, when you go to your doctor, with, especially with teenagers or children. But again, the immune, our immune systems are not created equal. Not all of us will create antibodies. Some of us might make them and it'll drop away quickly. It's, it's frustrating. You know, we would love to have black and white tools to say, have this test and you definitely had COVID and you definitely have long COVID. I mean, that's where we're heading with the research. We absolutely need better tools. For example, for EBV, if you ask your doctor if you're reactivated, you know, guys spoke about viral reactivation being, um, you know, people with ME have uh, trigger, uh, relapses, people with long COVID have relapses, you know, that sort of waxing and waning illness. And that could be a reawakening of one of these viruses. You may ask your doctor to test for reactivation. Really, we don't have clear-cut tools for that. You can surmise, you can try, um, but that's where we're heading with the research. I think uh, you know these basic tools that don't exist uh, are where we really want to see the field go. So that, and you know, some people argue, why do I need a confirmation of test? Why? Um, but the answer is anything we can document with our with our health. I think is important. It helps, gives us clarity. In the context of a brand new virus that's, you know, that is impacting us now, it's new, right? We may be new in the sense we've, it's been circulating for three years, but we don't know what the 10 year plan is. We don't know what our long-term health uh, impacts are going to be from that. So any documentation is useful. It's just frustrating that our immune systems aren't black and white and don't give us a clear picture of exactly what's, what we've had but certainly you know, using the tools available to us is, is useful. One of the strong hypotheses, uh, as I've sort of mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 clots our blood, or you know, it can cause what we call immunothrombosis. And I think it's pretty clear across the board, you know, people who are doing the research are seeing what we call a hypercoagulable state. It means, yeah, your blood's a bit sticky. We, we saw this early on, uh, you know, with participants, you know, you might notice when you're getting your blood drawn, it might stop. Like we know there's a hypercoagulable state. Uh, so we know that this is part of the picture. We don't necessarily know and can join the dots between the hypercoagulable state and then what symptoms that's causing, uh, including whether there's literal clots circulating or whether that's just something we see when we take the, your blood out of your vein and have a look in the laboratory. So, so essentially there's, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Certainly from uh, you know, other, you know, some of the serious impacts of getting COVID, we absolutely know clots are involved. You know, that's leading to heart issues. You know, we're seeing heart attacks, strokes, and all the rest of it. So clotting on the whole is happening. It's really hard to draw the link in any sort of certain way yet about whether there's any form of um, microclotting happening and circulating in everyone with long COVID, but it's certainly part of the picture. And yes, uh, so the sort of core symptoms and you know groups of symptoms that people experience are things like dysautonomia or what we call a disruption of you're basically your, your autopilot. So all of those things we don't even think about, like breathing, uh, our blood pressure and our heart rate. So, you know, it can be one of the common symptoms, even with people that don't necessarily identify as having long COVID, can see that or feel or notice that they had those symptoms during their early recovery. So that can mean, you know, you notice tachycardia, your heart racing a lot, and, uh, and also shortness of breath. So shortness of breath to me can be almost in those two polar camps. It could be that you've got dysautonomia in your nervous system, has been disrupted and so you have to learn to breathe properly again and certainly we hear good uh, you know feedback that people do breath work to, to to get that under control but it could also indicate you know a hypercoagulable state that your blood's not flowing 
wonderfully, um, you know, so whether there's clotting part of that, we don't know. But it's, you know, that, that's, that's sort of something to understand is that, you know, we don't actually have a strong lead on what's causing those things. So that's, so yeah, that's your tachycardia and your, um, and your shortness of breath. And yes, and so that obviously links into, you know, your, your heart rate going crazy, you know, like from standing up to sitting down. And that can be very severe in some people. You know, it can cause people to uh, feel very nauseous uh, and, and even faint and all the rest of it. So what's causing all of those things? No one really knows. Like there are hypotheses that an autoimmune uh, trigger is part of that picture, which again, we don't understand enough about even in itself, because to even test for autoimmunity, we have to know what we're looking for. You can't go and have a test done for autoimmunity because the tests are for particular uh, you know illnesses we know about so it could be and so again like autoimmunity is where you know during our infection and then recovery phase our immune system starts to attack some part of our body and whether that's vasculature or our vessels that is causing some of these symptoms we don't know um, and and even in the autoimmunity space it could be cellular where our cells are attacking or it could be antibodies where it antibodies are causing the damage so there's lots we don't know but we are sort of seeing the links you know those are the sort of common symptom groups that are all sort of coming together yeah where it, it's linking in the that sort of uh yeah you know is is clotting part of the dysautonomia or is it autonomic disruption yeah loads of unanswered questions but loads of research going on across all of those things which is which is the encouraging part like even in the context of, um, uh, you know, which virus is causing, you know, is it that we haven't cleared the virus? Is it our viruses that are, have, re -awake, have been reawakened, if you like? You know, there are core research groups that are diving deep into just answering, is SARS-CoV-2 hiding somewhere in the body? Because that'll help us unpack those things. So yeah, loads more to understand. The key top categories, I guess, of, of symptoms that people uh, report as being, you know, the big ones, and they can vary in, in mildness as well. You know, even someone, well, I think we're going to have a phase of, this, of, of recovery where people will say, oh, I'm fine, but, I'm fine, but, and I think those but categories can be different for different people. And one of, the, one of them, I think, is the neurological impairment, cognitive impairment, brain fog, you know, these are all the names that we sort of throw around uh, with this, what's, what we describe as brain fog. And I think it's going to be one of the most tricky to quantify. So when we sort of look at the research and the tools that there are, there, there might be tools that have been traditionally used for um, tracking loss of cognitive function. Another, in fact, one of the terms I quite like is impaired executive function. So, and what that's really meaning is, you know, you can function perfectly fine, you know, it's not like you're in a sort of severe state of brain damage, but things aren't gelling, things aren't working, you can't remember things, you stop mid-sentence, you don't function the way that you did. And I think that's the key part of this, that's really tricky to unpack, and it's going to be tricky to quantify, because do we have a tool to say, you know, yeah, you're fine as a functioning human, but we've got no tool to say you're not functioning the way that you once did. So I think we're, we're not really, how are we gonna measure that? I think that's the tricky thing, but it's probably one of the most common things that we hear is, uh, you know, where someone will say that they recovered fine, but, 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 you know, the, the, the brain, that brain part, or that uh, impairment, seems to be quite common and that's and that's why I'm saying in, in people who don't have long COVID so that can be absolutely severe debilitating if that's your core and uh, key feature of, of your uh, long COVID illness you can imagine that that will put you out of any job functioning just generally functioning you know it's completely confronting you know these are the types of feedback I've had right the way throughout the pandemic you know where brain function is just not there you know, from forgetting to do things and, and, and so on and so forth. So there's been lots of questions raised, you know, is this the virus infecting the brain? Do we see virus in the brain? What's causing that? 
The short answer is that we don't know. It, it's unlikely that, again, it's one of those things where it's unlikely that uh, everyone gets virus in the, in the brain. We don't sort of see that. But, you know, we're always going to see uh, through research that virus gets into places in some people uh, that's not common across everyone. So, you know, that's what we always have to be mindful of with um, uh, autopsy studies and things like that. You know, if they find virus in the brain, you know, is it because that person was severe or not? Uh, but certainly virus, I think, has, you know, it's been found in, in throughout the body in different organs. But generally speaking, we're not expecting it to be, uh, you know, that these brain impairments are largely from an actual viral uh, intrusion, if you like. But certainly, uh, you know, there is disruption going on in our brain and whether that's molecules going up there or, you know, signaling going to our brains that then impairs things so that, that causes this brain damage like, um, you know, function, I guess, you know, where we feel like, you know, that it's actually a, a, a brain injury type scenario. We don't really know exactly what's causing that, but yeah, lots of questions to, write, uh, to answer there. So what we do know about SARS-CoV-2 is that, as I've sort of said, we, we believe there's immune dysfunction at the centre of that. When I say dysfunction, it's kind of a term that has no real definition. We know what immunocompromised means, we know what immunosuppression means. You know, my grand goal is to tease apart immune dysfunction so that we can categorise what those, you know, which spectrums we've got there. And so underlying all of that, you know, if you, if you are in a state of dysfunction, because there are no tools to detect that, then you get infected with a virus. Uh, you may or may not be able to control that virus very well because you're already in, in a dysfunct state. You may already have, you know, an, an inflammatory type condition, especially things like autoimmunity. You know, autoimmunity is a state where our immune system has gone off track and, uh, you know, and there's inflammation and all those things. So it's not unsurprising that, you know, we're going to see an exacerbation of these types of inflammatory linked illnesses coming through things like diabetes, you know, diabetes, it depends, you know, like quite often it gets lumped in as diabetes. We need to sort of tease that apart. Is that the autoimmune diabetes that we're now seeing or is that type two? You know, like we, we have to be careful about how we, how we put those together, but essentially a lot of the um, autoimmune style illnesses are seeming to become more common. It's one of those things that's also difficult to document. I uh, was engaging with a, a bunch of doctors recently across all disciplines, all different specialties, and one of the comments that was made was, I don't know how to communicate this, or you know, we, we, or we can't document this, but every person we're seeing, their rare thing is way worse than we've ever seen before, whether that's a rare skin condition, generally in an inflammatory uh, setting, you know, so like whether, yeah, as I say, psoriasis or basically any type of inflammatory type of conditions, doctors are seeing them in worsened states. You know, yeah, so it's kind of telling us that, you know, this global sort of mass infection phase we're going through of SARS-CoV-2, that the flip side is that after that we're seeing lots of our standard illnesses looking and presenting in a worse manner. So to me, that's sort of pointing towards this immune disruption uh, and it's not to say that it's permanent and that you know that's that you know that we're all doomed or anything like that it's more that we've all had an immune disruption and what we need is a tool to understand when do we get back to baseline um, and to keep protecting ourselves we know that repeat infections is not a safe thing to do um, you know there, there are these sort of thoughts out there that you the more you get exposed to a virus the more the, the milder it will become or the less severe. And I just can't see where that information is coming from when we've got, uh, the, the virus is still circulating because it keeps evolving to evade our immune system. The reason our immune system is not shutting it down and we're more susceptible to reinfections is because our immune system no longer recognizes it. If the virus gets in and it takes a longer time for our immune system to shut it out because it's not the same anymore, it's leading to potential damage. So all of those things compounded is going to impact our, again, like our blood vessels, all of the things we've described with, you know, uh, the, 
upsetting our clotting pathways, upsetting our immune system, upsetting our onboard viruses, all of those things can lead to ongoing inflammation and susceptibility to other illnesses. What we're seeing internationally, you know, overseas, some countries have had wave after wave, they're probably losing count at how many times they've had waves sweeping through. I would like to think that here, we're not just going to catch up. And so what we're hearing internationally is that, you know, potentially it's this uncovering of susceptibility and not because, you know, every virus in the world's getting way worse for every population, but maybe we're not allowing that time to rest. And with it constantly circulating, there is no rest. You know, it's not a seasonal virus. So yes, I believe that, you know, what the, what the science is sort of looking like is that this virus is impacting our immune system. Even for those of us that don't uh, have any great symptoms, there's a sense of disruption, there's a, a layer of disruption that happens and that may lead to a susceptibility for a different uh, illness to then surface or an exacerbation of the illness you have. So if you already have an inflammatory condition, arthritis, any of those sorts of things, especially if they're autoimmune, it wouldn't be surprising that that inflames and gets worse because you've had SARS-CoV-2. And again, it all points to the fact that you've just given a big kick to your immune system. It's had to work hard to fight it off. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is there's no magic bullet. Um, rest is really the one tool we know is helping people. And that's tough. Um, but essentially, anything to uh, sort of look after your health and well-being that works for you is always going to help. Uh, and that includes nutrition, what works for you. It's always going to be useful uh, to seek assistance, you know, for those things because not one size fits all. You know, what your approach might be might not work for someone else. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot of tools to sort of manage uh, your life um, because there are no you know, clear treatment paths, but certainly rest and nourishing, uh, you know, basically replenishing the immune system if you are uh, depleted in anything. Like for me, you know, as this pandemic hit, I wanted to sort of uh, have some understanding of where, you know, am I deficient in anything before these waves uh, hit our shores? So that was the kind of thing I did, you know, it, it's going and checking to see if I had, um, you know, if my vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, you know, all those things. Sure, it might cost a little bit of money, but for me, it was sort of a peace of mind to sort of say, where's my, um, my general health at this point and can I do anything about that? And I will always use food to, to try and, uh, you know, be in a good place of health or supplement if, you know, if, if needed. Uh, but essentially, it's, those are the sorts of things that I did in preparation for the pandemic hitting our shores. Uh, so it would be sort of the, the flip side of just, you know, the, the sort of common sense type uh, looking after yourself, which is easier said than done. I know, you know, a lot of this comes down to whether you can afford it uh, with, and whether that's afford to rest and afford the money to seek help, whether that's medical or uh, nutritional or, or any of those other um, helping um, aids that we, you know, that we can seek. So yeah, unfortunately there's, there's not too many things, but there, there's loads of support out there and I think that's the key thing. I think the support networks are, are a wealth of information and one of the best places people can go to sort of not feel alone um, because loads of people are trying different things and, and that's great too, you know, to sort of get support, yeah. So hopefully in due course, you know, we'll start to see treatment options coming through but you know I know it's a frustrating place for and when you're ill to see how slow science can be and I'm trying my best here you know like we we know you know it's very underfunded here and um, you know there's been no biomedical research funding and uh, allocated funding uh, to to speed things up here there are you know pockets going on around the world but it's going to be slow but I think the other thing I will say is have hope. I think there's no time, you know, we've got the greatest amount of resources internationally, great minds all coming together and just, and, and bringing everyone together. This includes MECFS, long COVID, everyone working together because underlying this, these are post-viral illnesses 
and potentially viruses, our unborn viruses are at the core of that, um, which means all of these illnesses. And so the resourcing that's going into it is phenomenal, at least, you know, on an international scale. So I think having hope is, is, a, is a place to, you know, it, is, it should bring some comfort to, I think. One aspect with children and uh, young people is that we do know that children are less likely to get uh, long COVID, but to, to look out for the signs and symptoms and certainly let kids, you know, do as much resting as possible if you see any signs. And sometimes that can be change in moods, just general tiredness. Uh, like, you know, we even hear about children, you know, young ones who got it mildly, bounce back, no problem, but they might be off at daycare, child, you know, kindy, school, and parents are noticing they're just a bit more tired and taking them off themselves off for a nap. You know, just embrace that, you know, really, I guess that the key message is just keeping an eye out for any signs and symptoms, uh, you know, of just letting them rest. Because, you know, kids might not want to rest, you know, I want to go play this and that and the other thing. So generally they probably do self-limit um, if they're feeling exhausted. Um, and to not, you know, sort of say, you know, hey, shouldn't you be practicing this, that and the other thing? So being aware that this is happening, um, but, I, but I guess on the whole, we're probably seeing that, you know, there can be a long tail, just like our glandular fevers, uh, you know, there are some of us that have a horrible illness for a month or so, and others that it wipes out for a year. So similar sorts of things in, in children. So it's comforting that it's less likely to happen in children, but it certainly is happening. and. It's really heartbreaking when we hear really debilitating cases and they are happening, you know, very, very severe cases. Uh, and, and essentially, again, it could be outside the norm. You know, we're just, we don't understand what's gone wrong with that child's immune system and therefore it's impacted them really severely. Uh, you know, so that it could be linked to different scenarios, just like uh, in an adult as well, with, you know, where we don't understand why this illness is being triggered. So there's that side of things. And in teenagers, it's probably more common in teenagers. I would then, you know, hand wave and surmise, hmm, it's the certain age that we're starting to spread our Epstein-Barr virus. Is there a link between, you know, the age group that of teens that we've had more viruses, so that therefore we're more likely to get long COVID? But really, I guess, yeah, the message is just sort of the same as to, as a parent or a teacher as well. I, like, I think it's important in classrooms too to just keep an eye out for these behaviours uh, in, or, or signs and symptoms that they're not recovering very well. And the message is, is again, resting. It's really, uh, I've, it's really sad hearing cases where um, the advice has been the wrong advice and, you know, they'll get fine, just gradually exercise and it's done the reverse and made them housebound. We have heard of that happening. So it's it's that same message that, you know, uh, we don't want to necessarily frame everything around historical advice or, or, or essentially, you know, we need to keep moving with new advice too. And I think that's really loud and clear that this, if this virus is clotting our blood, it's, exercise is never gonna work for anyone. We, until we have that tool to measure your blood is flowing perfectly well and you're back to your baseline and that there's no danger at all, it's going to be a tricky thing to manage. But certainly that the main message is to, is to look out for those signs and symptoms. People think um, that, you know, once you've had your infection, you're now not at risk. Uh, there's no public health messaging raising the alarm that we, we really don't know the future. And I think that's, that's where we're at. It's raising the awareness to not let our guard down and, and prevent infection. I would like to see a future where our respiratory viruses or illnesses that are circulating are like our UV index. That it's not a dirty word to say COVID-19. It's not an eye roll moment to say, can you please do a rat before you come to my house? It needs to be part of our future that we care about each other's health. We care about our own health and every infection is a risk, you know, we, we don't need to go through waves and waves of illnesses, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. So that's kind of where I'd really like to see the future is that public health messaging is part of the everyday noise around us so that it's not a frustration. It's, it's not that 
annoying person in the family that constantly goes on about, you know what I mean? Like that, that's what I would like to see so that we are starting to hear about, you know, what's circulating. Um, yeah, that, and so we know as, from internationally, we know that COVID-19 has been sweeping through and waves upon wave upon wave. We don't really see where this is going to end without new tools coming forward. We hope that there, there'll be new uh, sterilizing vaccines, which means as soon as you inhale uh, the virus up your nostrils, your um, mucosal immunity shuts it down before it infects you. So that we call that sterilizing. So you're not actually getting infected and then your immune system goes, oh goodness, a new virus and has to wake up and fight it off. With the new generation vaccines, which are likely underway, will shut it down. So that's kind of, you know, we have to bide our time. So we have to, you know, protect what we got. We, you know, we've only got one body and we need to keep it safe. And I think, you know, we can only do that in a community way because it's really sad to see that as soon as health protections are taken away, vulnerable communities are getting more and more isolated. And so the person who's frustrated about COVID-19 and says, I want my restaurants, I want my fun, I don't want my masks, is telling the vulnerable person, you can no longer participate in society. And that's really upsetting to see. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act because we all want, you know, to, 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 to end up in a place of normality or a new norm. It's not going back. And it's frustrating, I think, that it feels like we're trying to go back instead of move forward. We need tools to move forward. And that's going to start with, you know, it being normal and mainstream to care about how clean our air is, filtering our air, ventilation, and looking after our vulnerable, you know. So who knows what's ahead, but I hope that it's a, you know, that we move in a, in a positive direction in that regard. Um, but yeah, and as I say, having hope that we'll, we will um, break ground with post viral illnesses so that we can come up with treatments and understand what we've generally, or what globally we've ignored, is boring viruses that we just live with.